Hello everyone, today we talk about German violence during the reign of Emperor Frederick II, 1212 uh, which was in fact frequently punctuated by political violence in the German kingdom proper, not only of course. Violence which however in Germany would take on a, a, a greater, say, political institutional value right in the broader context of a bit the rise of uh, you know medieval civilization the, the, the increase and uh, power of the local lords but also of the, the lower classes um, there are many ways to, to interpret that certain processes in a land like Germany that w was very composite right in, in nature where some, some were you know some of the richest areas in Europe think about Cologne at least some said like in northeastern Germany were sound still the least you know uh, not the least dynamic but still you know not particularly developed there, there were important connections with uh, with France uh, with Italy uh, with at this point properly a, a universal policy that Frederick II embodied as such and you know what the broader context is we made actually a video on properly on Frederick II like a bit on an introduction to his life we created an uh, Hohenstaufen playlist so and uh, there is also a medieval Germany playlist in which th this is all gone to, to fit um, we haven't talked however that much about uh, about the 13th century in general right Frederick II definitely being a bit, bit basically the most representative uh, uh, you know legendary iconic uh, figure of, uh, and, and dramatic Right, a uh, tragic figure of of this phase in history that saw a lot of change, and some say, in fact, the death of universalism with 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 the one of Frederick himself. Um, the uh, extinction of the Hohenstaufen took some time, and uh, there the Swabian power didn't collapse uh, all of a sudden. But indeed, uh, after Frederick's death, the uh, it's no, it didn't even start there in terms of the decentralization of, of local powers, etc. But you know, properly there is the rise of what we call as princely Germany. So this um, highly fragmented political reality, where certain main houses eventually would assume power in, in a private sense, right? There is properly the uh, evaporation of public authority. Germany since the mid 12th century had fundamentally. Uh, worked a lot under the Hohenstaufen and then specifically with Frederick I um, to the um, essentially modernization of the country alongside the, the pattern of the, uh, the the Western Frankish monarchy that is up to that point Germany had uh, still actually the Eastern Frankish kingdom uh, hadn't um, properly adopted Frankish feudalism at, at its fullest because um, property in Germany was distributed in, in, in a different way and also present a different measure than, than in France, right? Up to the 12th century, Germany is still a kind of a archaic, kind of primitive reality. And here, instead, the Hohenstaufen worked to properly give it a, um, a, a political institutional profile alongside um, a central monarchy as the ones that were developing f in, in France, uh, in England. And the main problem with, in this picture was naturally the, the absence of a pre-grest central structure, right? Uh, the Hohenstaufen actually worked pretty well, right? But they also were unlucky in a sense, and uh, they mostly invested, as you know, their resources, not much in decentralization of Germany as such, that in, in many ways was realistically difficult to, to achieve but rather in Italy where they could find objectively the resources to not create a, a German kingdom but properly a universal empire that had to be centralized in Italy right preferentially in you know after the Hohenstaufen he inherited Sicily it would be yeah Palermo or Frederick the second favorite was Apulia but more precisely Rome as all Roman emperors, right? And from there, properly reuniting East and West, uh, Henry VI uh, w went close, in a sense, um, to that. But there were important overturns that uh, there weren't even, like, an important collapse in imperial strategy after the defeat of Legnano. 
uh, but rather the premature death of Henry VI and the minor age of Frederick II himself, so that when we talk about the latter, we're actually looking at um, a German policy that, albeit is taken by Frederick as a king of Germany, very seriously, right, uh, was already, uh, you know, w was already witnessing the, the, the turning of, of the tide in a project of political reaffirmation of public authority, that is to say, Frederick II gave that policy up, right, especially in uh, 1231, 1232, when the Statutum in Favorem Principum was uh, affirmed, right, um, this, mm, this document w was extremely important because basically it was granting to delay any ecclesiastical princes of the empire certain uh, prerogatives, essentially the, the maintenance of the, the regalia, right, of essentially royal rights, uh, that is to say, these these people fundamentally had occupied um, royal, seized royal assets, and it was now complicated to to get them back. And that's where properly today we talk about this this picture of, of, of violence and how this was it was carried out properly from a political military point of view. But it's just a sketch, right? Then eventually we will get a bit more in detail about the individual uh, realities. Um, and that marked in Germany essentially a very specific, um, uh, you know, era because it, it started to show also from the uh, from public authority the highest, the king, the you know, the royal, the, the emperor's one uh, of let's say of essentially of abandonment as we've seen of public authority of, of public yeah of public uh, authority as a mean of uh, you know construction of a central monarchy and actually the 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 pra more pragmatic carving of um private domains right this way the the, the Hohenstaufen had built in fact their their power in Swabia right like just all the great um uh, german dynasties like the the Ottonians the the Salians uh the, these princes were elected at the end of the day because they they had gained a considerable amount of power right on the base of private property um so the the Ostrogoths as we've seen were the only ones who had tried to to go beyond this but at this point properly so that wasn't much to do uh, frederick preferred notoriously his italian possessions and Literally, because you see, 19th century nationalistic historiography in Germany said, ah, look at the Hohenstaufen, and they, they lost you know, after the Mediterranean chimera and all this. It, it, that's nonsense, right? Uh, there was properly no way to, to make things work uh, differently, right? Swabia here was was very important because the south of Germany was richer uh, and uh, the, the, it was connected to, to Italy, the Al through the Alps. Um, Fre the Saint Frederick II tried to expand with it after the, the extinction of the Babenberg um, uh, dynasty in Austria. The, in fact, the, the, that that gap that would be filled by the Habsburgs, uh, first by the Bohemians, then, then by the Habsburgs later on, right to consolidate this strong southern German reality, but through private means. That is to say, the same exact ones that the, uh, the 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 princes of the empire were using to to aggrandize themselves, to carve their own uh, powers on their own. So we could digress long on this because uh, Germany, as we've seen, is complex. Uh, it has a lot of these minor powers. It's literally a puzzle and a mess, to say the least. And this is also why this kind of um, increase in violence is, is is witnessed right under the reign of Frederick the second which which surely had some you know uh, specific political causes to bring to, to, to such uh, to such wars because of the strained relations between Frederick and the papacy the broader involvement you know France the the Lombard League I mean uh, certain that the you know the, here there is a, a very large scale uh, in fact, universal policy that included the the Crusade in the Near East, uh, the fate of the Teutonic Order, of the military orders altogether, um, and so it's we can't embrace that. But in terms of local power, 
right, we notice that um, there is an intensification properly in, in, in German of, of wars, right, that we can uh, sum up today uh, briefly, right. First of all, the war of, of a Saint Frederick for, for the throne, the one with Otto IV, uh, that we documented we made multiple videos explaining the passage from, you know, Henry VI to Otto IV uh, and Frederick II. We made a, a video about the Battle of Bouvines. Uh, we made, uh, in January, I think, a video on uh, the rise of Philip of Swabia uh, that was actually, uh, as king uh, of, of the Romans, does, uh, you know, it was Henry VI's brother, it was assassinated as long as it was, it was elected for political violence, by the way. Uh, and the rising fact of Otto the Fort, um, so that already t gives you, um, let's say, a picture of how messed up uh, already the situation really was. Consider at this time there wasn't anything like properly a, a, an institutionalized elective system in Germany that would arrive essentially by the mid f uh, 14th century. That is, you know, uh, not just far in time, but properly, you know, in a completely different reality um, at that point. Um, Otto the Fourth's struggle was uh, mostly exemplificative of how autonomous princely power really was, because you know even here what the deal was. Otto was the uh, the first and last Welfen emperor, and he did as a Guelph essentially the same exact policy uh, of the Hohenstaufen as, as 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 soon as he rose to power. Right, he essentially got his uh, uh, empire by allying himself with Innocent III that was still patronizing um, essentially uh, Frederick II's reign in Sicily with, against the promise of fact of not reuniting uh, the empire with, with Sicily, right? Because there was the, you know, essentially Sicily was a papal system, whereas ever since at least the, you know, even before Henry VI, but even more after, you know, when in fact, you know, um, uh, Frederick was born, right? Uh, the Hohenstaufen were claiming at that point the, of course, the full possession of the of the Sicilian kingdom. It was granted by feudal law, but properly the idea that 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 belonged at that point to the empire, right? That at this point was already conceived, in, if you want, in more secular terms than it had been before. That is to say, all Western Christendom was theoretically within the empire, France. Uh, Spain, whatever. It's just that realistically, no emperor from Germany could could ever, uh, you know, accomplish such, you know, reunification. Hell, even Francis the, the first, in, in at the beginning of the sixteenth century, could be elected Holy Roman Emperor, right? He he's just uh, spent a lot of money for that. Um, but uh, southern Italy was an area that historically the Germans had, you know, ventured into to trying to secure their control in mostly, in fact, not just in an anti-Byzantine or in before anti-Saracen function, but specifically to essentially uh, surround the, the papacy that up to that point had done its true best to, to avoid this in a, with any possible way. And that also the, uh, actually the increasing political violence here could be observed even in the ever more ideologized forms that political propaganda took, especially under the reign of Frederick II, who was literally portrayed as the Antichrist, is, you know, has also, uh, in a sense, distorted all the, uh, even the historical possibility of understanding better certain aspects about the emperor's personality. Uh, you know, uh, after Kantorowicz and Abu Lafia, we don't properly have even a, a true biography of Frederick II, because it's something very mysterious still, and you would think we, we know everything about uh, a ruler like him uh, in the 13th century? Well, not, because every time we make a research on him, something new comes up, and um, and it's really one of the most interesting figures, and we will have to make a lot of, of videos about him um, still, of course. Um, so Otto had essentially reinvested in the same... Uh, uh, Hohenstaufen imperial policy that is essentially also the anti-nationalistic historiographical idea that you know the the wealth and uh, the the Brunswick were you know just the the true Germans of the north were thinking more of expanding to, towards the Baltic the 
uh, the, the Slavic East and they didn't care about the Mediterranean, whatever. No, he, he did. In fact, as soon as the guy became emperor as a, as a Welfen still, he did the same exact thing the Swabians were doing. Uh, and of course, he would do that. And you know how the situation eventually went because uh, Otto IV at that point went to Italy campaign there. He he started war against the He marched on Rome. He revoked the conquered date of Worms. Right? It's, it's, it's something that was completely um, in, in the full wake of the imperial public authority legacy, etc. Uh, he invaded Sicily. Uh, that he demanded actually formal submission of from, from Frederick II, who, albeit having no forces, actually had an enormous courage to stand so young against the Otto in Calabria and so on. But what saved the situation there was actually the German princes, because in Germany, the same people who had elected Otto uh, rose in revolt, right, for many reasons. They were essentially local, but sometimes also more important. For example, at that point, the, the, the Danish Valdemar of Denmark was, was expanding dramatically its power, was seizing properly certain areas in the Baltic that were also historically, you know, uh, a bit, uh, in fact, the, the the pride with Lübeck, with you know, also the Anseatic traffic, etc. The, the the of of the um, of the Braunschweig, of of the you know of the of the Welfen in in Saxony, and um, so because these German princes were of course interested in having somebody that this was the main deal. They they wanted to elect somebody who was not too strong, not too weak. Right, it didn't have to be as strong to be able to subjugate the whole Germany. It had to be too weak to, you know, not to be essentially the police guy they could call when, when a, you know, uh, a neighbor was harassing them. Uh, and the whole thing, as you understand, in a dramatically fragmented situation where where the mess was was uh, normal, right? As we've seen before, also the the Rhine and southern Germany were uh, essentially the the most. Western, Southern Germany were the most advanced areas. Like we speak of the north of the Eastern Germany, were basically left on their own because it, the royal power also was was far from as properly as you know from the centers of assets of powers concentrated in Swabia and Franconia, etc. To um, to intervene and to even be interested in intervening there. So certain areas were literally left uh, on their own. Like violence here had. Is a general profile we find in you know in the Middle Ages, in Germany it was also the norm, and very much so in certain in certain areas due to this chronic political fragmentation. Then eventually Otto came back to Germany. You know the story. He didn't uh, find much support. He had in 1213 to to ally with the, with John of England. You know after the the uh, French attempted invasion uh, of Britain. Uh, and uh, they they mounted up together the expedition of Bouvines that factually was, uh, you know, saw a very scarce German participation because Otto couldn't find allies proper. They were mostly Flemish troops plus the English mercenaries paid with by a state worth of this name like England properly, where Germany was uh, at this point completely, you know, uh, after with the minority of Frederick II, like, these people went wild. Right, grabbing, land grabbing of any kind, right? Because royal authority had evaporated from a place in they it wasn't where we had never been that that this strong in the first place. Um, so the mess. Uh, other important, uh, well, of course, Otto was defeated. He died uh, shortly afterwards. Frederick II had already been elected emperor by Innocent III that at that point had come back to, you know, the the, 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 the counter-election of essentially to, to Otto that had been excommunicated, usually, right? Then, here, we can't properly say all the mess that happened in Germany every time something, you know, happened between Frederick and the Pope. But we, um, we point out some of the major uh, events here. The first one is the rebellion of his son Henry known as Henry VII, um, uh, uh, in, uh, in 1234. This was his, um, you know, the, the, son, the only son he had with, with, the, with the Aragonese princes. And he, the, the guy here, and the story is complex, um, the, he, he surely rose in revolt against his father, but he was also backed by these noblemen that basically obliged him to issue the first uh, document that eventually would 
provide further you know elements for the statute in favor of the princes that we've seen before uh, he messed up an, an important stability in Germany it, 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 Frederick was here involved dramatically in you know the, the struggles with the Lombard League with lots of problems etc so intervention was not immediate Henry kept you know um, you know, being uh, you know rebellious for for some time, that there was nat naturally some negotiation, but eventually, and it's interesting that the um, the event that seemingly caused more directly the intervention of his father north of the Alps again was um, the um, you know the the the, the issued the. the the issued abortion of the Archbishop of Bremen's crusade against the rebellious peasants of Stedingen uh, was also a bloody affair that shows uh, how also in 13th century Germany the, the rise of the lower classes, the, of, even of the infantry, etc. Germany, like we discussed, like, like in Italy, aside from you know the very extremes like uh, Switzerland in the far south or the um, this marsh in, in the far north, right? You know, but in the land properly, they would, would never witnessed uh, an infantry victory as such. But surely during the 13th century, think about Borgen in 1288. But there are lots of other battles that show that this definitely provides you the the picture of of a of, a, of a, an important even rise in wealth in demographics. Germany at this point was 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 rising very quickly, right? Consider that by the uh, the 14th century would surpass even Italy in in demographics. So it it was something big. It, it was a moment of great. Uh, Germany took a while to take off economically compared to southwestern Europe. But when it did in the last centuries of the Middle Ages was was really impressive, really massive, right? And these are effectively the 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 first. Um, uh, you know symptoms of that. But it's it's fascinating that still. Um, you know the Henry's intervention into essentially an Inquisition matter that Frederick the Second at that point had a great interest to 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 to, to politically uh, manage uh, that point uh, with the going against the Archbishop of Bremen brought to this to to his father's intervention against him that and, and shows of course the degree of of violence that properly existed you know you know an Archbishop of Germany launching. A crusade within the same Germany to to crush uh, a peasant community, um, and um, so eventually he uh, Henry was uh, was obliged to to capitulate. Frederick didn't forgive him, right? And here some say because he was already ill, uh, he had uh, contracted leper again, as you know his corpse. Um, you know, examination has recently confirmed. You know what this guy did. He is eventually he was imprisoned, and he died in in Calabria, apparently throwing himself um, off a cliff on a on a mule to you know uh, while he was uh, you know de deciding his own fate fundamentally. But his father actually gave him a you know a proper burial, etc. And properly the reason why he d he didn't forgive him might have been the fact that he was physically unfit. Right, and that being rebellious at that point, there was no way to, to save him in, in front of the public. Frederick II is a very fascinating figure because uh, depending on the various realities he, he moved in as German king, uh, Holy Roman Emperor, uh, Italian king, Sicilian king, uh, Pope's um, you know, adoptive son, crusader, had a different face every time. Right, and the the German face was actually a very, you know, a very proper one, right? And he wasn't a tender-souled person, right? He knew how to deliver, also an astonishing amount of violence. And um, he still fundamentally believed in in the possibility of also using the iron fist in certain realities, especially like it proved on, on the Lombard League. Well, at the end, to not much effect, but especially inheriting his grandfather's. Um, face at that point in, in that specific scenario, um, and there is um, also the conspiracy of the Rhenish bishops against uh, Frederick's son Conrad IV in the years following uh, 1241. Even more important, the revolt against the Hohenstaufen rule, inspired by the anti-kings Henry Raspe 
Landgrave of Thuringia in 1246, uh, 1247, and William II Count of Holland in 1247, 1256. Um, these two figures are very fascinating because they actually didn't accomplish um, too much uh, in a royal sense in Germany, but still they are eloquently showing, uh, you know, a bit different, but still uh, important local dynamics that reveal the, the, the kinesis of, of, of Germany uh, at that point proper. Henry of Rasp essentially was, as part of you know, the dynasty of the, the Landgravate of Thuringia, he succeeded, if I'm not wrong, his, his brother's death, and he uh, had uh, his nephew and um, her, his um, uh, sister-in-law essentially imprisoned, right? He, he basically took on control. Interestingly enough, Frederick the Se uh, of Thuringia, uh, Frederick the Second, at that point, uh, actually accepted him as the governor of Germany uh, during the minor age of his son Conrad IV, right? But in these years, uh, Henry over properly he he had himself elected anti king right and even moved in fact war against correct uh, the fort and he defeated him at the battle of nida uh, where however the same henry was mortally wounded in fact dying shortly afterwards uh, and um, this is an interesting picture of how uh, essentially a uh, Central Eastern German power could could even rise to to to, to con con with rising with consensus fundamentally of all the other princes in, in anti Hohenstaufen function at this point uh, in a very important uh, moment also of the struggle of Frederick the uh, second against the Lombard League with new defeats would come right so mm, there's the, the German political thermometer was about you know as long as he's committed elsewhere let, let's fundamentally. Uh, grab as much as we can. Uh, eventually, the royal title was taken, uh, usurped. At this point, Frederick died in 1250, famously enough, by William II, Count of Holland. Right, who ruled in 40 years, as we've seen, nine years. Um, Holland is basically the, the yeah, uh, on, on the northwestern most corner of the empire, right? So it's not a dramatically wasn't a dramatically productive, at least uh, at the time, uh, area. Uh, and it was fundamentally involved mostly in local realities. But, you know, still, William II is remembered as one of the most important rulers of Holland at this time. He founded an astonishing amount of uh, royal, you know, centers for royal power, let's say, uh, especially in the Hague, uh, etc. Uh, and he fought an important series of wars, including in the Rhineland, so in the rich, most productive, and still close, objective, to Holland area uh, in, in Germany. Uh, and he even led the siege of, uh, of Cologne, right? He fought also bitterly against lots of people, actually against the, the Flemish, against which in, you know, also brought to the enmity of, of, of the French at that point, uh, uh, against the, the Frisians, right? He actually was killed in, in this phase because he was essentially crossing a, a, a frozen river. The, the, the horse got weird. He, he fell into the, the, the frozen river, and the Frisians arrived and, and cut him down from the mansion. And that's how he died. His corpse was taken back 26 years later after being concealed um, uh, by his own, um, I mean, his own son, who came to repress the Frisians further. So, some, you know, a very warlike ru ruler. That even in here, as we've seen, both with Henry of Raspe, William II of Holland, it, they ended killed fundamentally in battle, waging wars, and taking advantage of this broader situation. He, William II, also married a Welf, and so this gave him some theoretical, uh, you know, prestige in, in Germany, broadly speaking, but his territorial power couldn't get very far. This is the drama eventually that would occur in what we call as princely Germany, because. At this point, there were all these many, and still at this age specifically, territorially incoherent realities to build something more centralized, right? And, and all these various uh, lords, local lords, had to uh, 
essentially carve their their, their own weight and, 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 and power out out of this mess, right? And that's how eventually the Alpbergs, the the Vett and the Wittelsbach, the uh, even the Hohenzollern, etc., you know, came came the Luxembourgs came to power. Uh, and uh, it was a slow process. It took it took an important uh, while. Here, the thing was still dramatically fluid, and especially in a phase, as we've seen, of medieval history, where properly um, the uh, you know instability was fueled by further enrichment. Right? That is, it's not a surprise that the golden bull that came to to sanction properly was all the imperial electors were to give a more you know. Um, this institutionalized profile to 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 the feder to the, the, the federation uh, emerged in the mid 14th century because that's after the contraction that we described countless times it brought essentially the lower classes to sink the the ancien regime to be formed and to to these main rulers to to take over right simply also because these areas were also exhausted by war and, and that's a very important thing now we will talk about the ministerialis in a while but for who studied, for example, like me, the, the, the 13th century, 14th century ministerialis from German knighthood, um, it and mercenaries, and both in Germany and in Italy, etc. Uh, well, you see that there, that there is literally even a, properly an exodus of of German warriors for the rest of Europe, right? And there is this also chivalric um, ethos that what the, the, the Orangetaufen managed properly to spread in Germany and to make of it a, a really a feudal land, right? As we've seen by the rise of the Orangetaufen, Germany wasn't a land. By the 14th century, uh, Germany was considered to be sometimes properly more more of a feudal place in terms of chivalric capacities, of even in the strength of its cavalry, probably its knights, that could rival with France, that however was now structured into you know, a real, you know, Unity, whereas Germany was still now the consolidation of of separated principalities that contended com, competed for for the the elective crown, right? Which is a very different thing. Uh, in short, there is a much more privatized military culture that is proper of Germany in the first place. We were looking at it well recently when we made that video about um, Conrad um, the uh, the second. Right, the Salian dynasty were making outlining the main differences between um, uh, Germany and Italy at that point, and you realize that the Germany was already by that time, at the beginning of the 11th century, well, was fundamentally a uh, you know the the majority of people were not technically free. I mean, they were under a lord, right? And the same spread of ministeriality. We will talk about in a while that at this point uh, starts reaching its peak, especially in the richest and not surprisingly areas of Germany in, in the south. They could reach up to ninety percent of the of of, of German knights at, at their play. reveals what the, how you know properly privatistically imbued this political culture was, right? You know, German knights were not free; they were at least they, they had become a minority. The majority of German knights were servants, could be both purchased, um, sent somewhere else uh, to leave. Um, it's a dramatic, we will talk about that because it's very fascinating. And these were completely identical to, to any other knights, it's just that their political and social status, like in all the areas of Europe, knights were practically all the same, militarily wise, but they, they, were, they were different, even in juridical status at this point. So that gives you an idea of, of properly even the, the 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 pride, the prestige, the 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 the, the absolute mm, carelessness, let's say, towards public authority that by default existed in Germany. Um, that was you know created eventually along you know around this political institutional idea of the elective monarchy, just as a way, like in other countries, to say okay, public authority, st st we accept you as long as you make a bit of things in order, but as long as you stay out of our territories that are ours, right? So this is mafia sense, right? And that's exactly what we're talking about in, also in that video that uh, we made recently about the Central uh, and Eastern European markets altogether. Germany is difficult to frame in this because it has a lot of Western, it's fundamentally a Frankish country. Right and uh, by by political culture etc. But it also has a lot in common with this kind of rel very relative 
and uh, you know, you see the, the the area will remain like this until the the German unification in the 19th century, and and it it, it really made a lot of difference in European history under so many points of view that are often overlooked. Um, so um, there are also other hotbeds of, uh, of of you know of war properly. For example, the Eichstätt region. Uh, these um, you know there were problems created by the the counts of Hirschberg in the twenties of the thirteenth century, um, and however that do not seem to have specifically contributed to the broader civil war scenario that took place by the 40s of the 13th century. Uh, so much that it reveals how, also locally speaking, there were realities that would simply fight against each other uh, independently also of, of the larger dynamics. Um, so not even to say properly that during, you know, before the 40s, Frederick II's reign was not uh, marked by the other important um, uh, phenomena of political violence that were actually typical of the German regional framework, right? Uh, and uh, this struggle over resources was, was present everywhere. Literally, you don't have here. Also, it brought often to the opposition uh, of the bishops and counts. Benjamin Benjamin Arnold wrote a beautiful book about that, um, and um, and it, it, it's not an option. You see that that's something. It is difficult to understand for a modern mindset sometimes. The idea that war, in certain realities, is not a matter of deciding whether you want to do it or not, but you basically have no other way if you want to stay independent or autonomous, to enjoy some liberty, right? Imagine you have, uh, look at a political map of Germany here, inserted some, some you know, close-ups um, of some certain er areas. You can immediately see what it was, right? all dramatically fragmented. Just imagine all these um, things, these colors here you see that are also approximate because no no map can can properly portray reality, and especially the one of a feudal uh, world, uh, you know, Germany in the 13th century. But think about the, the, the pure and absolute mess deriving from this situation. I mean, the, the idea that every, you, every single neighbor across even hundreds of kilometers has something to say in your own business. You can, you you resent of of, of any of these um, cha political changes. You have to take a side because it's you you can't stay out of it. Either you are from from that guy's side or the other. Are, you are from the king of, of for, for the king of or for the anti king. Um, otherwise, you would be wiped out. You 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 couldn't do it on your own because these powers were individually. You know, if you're you don't join, you're weak. You can't be taken uh, over by someone else. It's that easy. So you have to always to stay sharp and see what happens and try to solve the the damn problem uh, on your own. And if you don't have a satisfactory military retinue to defend your territory, there is no way out of it, right? You're gonna be overrun. And all these powers had always had their own military retinue. Right, like any other power in Europe, yes, but properly, they were sometimes more directly invested in this um, properly in this uh, office. So much that, for example, the German bishops weren't the only ones in in, in Europe that fought wars. We we found it so many in uh, everywhere, like in 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 England, in France, in Italy, in Spain, every right. But Germany took like kind of a more more of a taste in that because. Uh, Properly, these episcopates were always kind of under siege, in a way or another. Uh, and uh, there are many battles in which uh, bishops had to to struggle to, to 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 maintain their autonomy because a bishop can't properly be removed and being substituted by someone else. It belongs to these important families, of course, that are all, in fact, competing for uh, the diocese control and all its wealth, right? In all its uh, immunities that the lay uh, territories d do not quite have in the same way the church has. So that reflects all with the papal policy, the imperial policy. It's a freaking mess. In, in the early 13th century, um, Cesarius of uh, Heisterbach uh, claimed uh, in a well-known place that with some peril 
to their souls, quote, nearly all the bishops of Germany wield a double sword, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, here it doesn't mean a double hand, it means specifically the secular as well as the spiritual authority, right? And there are many battles throughout all the 13th century, and this time, uh, actually bishops were often defeated also. The bishop of Utrecht, for example, uh, in front of um, Chevo then, uh, in 1227, uh, the Archbishop of Magdeburg at the River Bise in 1240, the Bishop of Strasbourg at the Battle of, of Hausberg, and then there are Vor there is Voringen, famously enough, in 1288, right? Um, uh, the were important institutional development also that there is the 1214-55 um, Treaty of uh, Eichstätt, where, you know, uh, at that point the, the bishop, the local bishop had done well, but fundamentally was um, creating uh, in this area between you know Bavaria and Franconi, uh, you know uh, a compromise between the the authority of the counts uh, of Hirschberg and the same heart of the bishopric, um, and these relations are very complicated indeed. At some point we will go in detail properly in them. Uh, there were lots uh, of attritions in in this uh, between bishops and counts everywhere. For example, the counts of Gelders and of Holland. Uh, as we've seen uh, now, were the, the the main enemies of the Bishop of Utrecht. Uh, the Counts of Hals, the ones of the Bishop of Passau. The Archbishop of Cologne historically had had problems from, from the uh, decent secular magnates. Um, the Counts of Jülich, properly being probably the most tenacious and violent ones, uh, Cologne, remember, was uh, an electoral seat. It was usually where you know the the, the Roman emperor was, the the Roman the king of the Romans was was elected properly together. Well, yeah, there were other places, uh, Aachen closely to it, but also Frankfurt. But th that's not properly the point. The point is that um, this was a, a very powerful um, ecclesiastical prince that would fundamentally take over the same city. The city, at some point, you see, in Germany, uh, the communes never managed to gain to gain a, a true uh, independence, right? They could get s certain specific um, titles like the one of Freie Reichstätte, uh, Free Cities of the Empire, to say, basically it was an imp from the emperor to, to say, okay, don't touch that city. But uh, German cities didn't have an authority outside their walls, right? Because it was always either the bishop or the count that ruled. Um, and even the, this huge... The, the, the largest center in Germany, Cologne, doesn't make it. It's under the bishop control. And it's a hell of a power, right? And some of the most important policies, I don't know, think about uh, even the struggle between Frederick Barbarossa and um, Henry the Lion actually stemmed from, from the Rhineland because, you know, uh, it wasn't because, as people said, of this dramatic imperial competition, etc., that still existed an enemy. But it was because the guy had, you know, infested the ecclesiastical lands in the area, and uh, the bishops had had fundamentally uh, complained in front of the emperor, and that was, especially the the, ecclesia the, the, the archbishop of Cologne, etc., those were guys you couldn't, as an emperor, ignore in that regard, in request. So, but it was always about this ha constant harassment between each other to, to grab their, each other's lands, and when as it often happened in Germany, public authority evaporated. Uh, there was no way. In fact, in fact, the part of the reason why these bishops were properly emperor makers, were, they had such an important electoral power, was that historically they had, they were the ones who who had the, the greatest interest, like also in other in other countries, like in France, in England, wherever. To uh, in Italy, it had happened the same um, with German rule. Uh, to uh, to uh, to actually strengthen the to properly to create a monarchy, to have somebody who could defend their own rights and, and giving them the legitimization of sacrality and, and all these things uh, in turn, and therefore developing importantly on the base of the on this um, of this you know this system this central system by a certain degree. As we were saying before, this was all intertwined with the uh, this specific German phenomenon 
of uh, the ministerialis, of the knightly ministerialis, this armed um, servant, knighthood, right? That so it's peak fundamentally uh, under. Uh, I don't know whether it's fair to say under Frederick II's reign, because also in later times were very important, right? But generally speaking, with the rise of the princes, their their decline uh, began, right? Because their the ministerialis were essentially a tool in the hands, often of the the aforementioned royal ecclesiastical axis that had been formed. Uh, it was mostly the bishop retinues to be composed by these men, not only. Right uh, in certain areas, as we've seen before, it, like Swabia or Austria, they they actually were quite numerous, and they made up the, the proper bulk of 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 the of the local military power, right? But they had been used uh, essentially because of their uh, of this special conditions of theirs, so the fact that they could be properly created, also by public authority, sold whatever, to be used properly as um, as as for, for by the emperors as as a, a political pawn, if you want. Uh, why? Because contrary to the lay um, feudatories, the ministeriales were could not oppose themselves to royal demands. Right? Vassals in Germany were notoriously paid to perform their most duty. Right, certain areas, especially in the northeast of Germany, didn't even contribute with knights anymore. Famously enough, at the Battle of Legnano, Frederick Barbarossa suffered with lack of Saxon reinforcements, um, and uh, usually it had been uh, bishop military retinues. In fact, it had formed the uh, the, the Hohenstaufen's armies uh, regularly, and and ministerialis as well. But that as well, in the sense that, you know, they were mostly made up of ministeriales. And uh, these people, as, you know, being non-freemen, right, and at this point being such also the de facto, like, you know, they didn't have still, uh, they were becoming uh, very powerful fast. Some of them would become richer and more powerful and more influent than even the free nobility. But they um, were initially also coming from a lower uh, social status. Therefore, this way, was, this military service uh, for public authority was a way to promote their own uh, their own status. And as we've seen, Germany was growing, economically speaking, so there, there were, uh, and demographically speaking too, which is not always, you know, in parallel. So there were lots of, this is a common phenomenon historically, you know, lots of, essentially, of this, of, you know, People have nothing to lose that can't fuel in the you know the, the fill the ranks of the you know of some you know magnate that can use them as as mil their military uh, leverage, right? And ministerialis were, however, uh, um, you know the, the, properly the defensive mainstay of princely or local rule, as broader as client tales. Ministerialis had been born as as the term says, also is to be found in Latin, in medieval middle Latin, often in other realities, as admi local administrators, right? They were essentially non vassals that however administrated castles often uh, properly garrisoning them as as if they they, they were, right? And responding to their lords and as we've seen very being sometimes fanatically uh, loyal and obedient and uh, you know devoted to, to that to that specific task. Um, also, uh, ministerialists were to be found often in Germany uh, among the retinues that, that participated to the Baltic Crusades undertaken by the Teutonic Order. There are, there are lots of, of even famous uh, individuals. Um, the, the, it was typical at certain levels to, to even go out there for the crusade, never, never to come back, as it would happen to pick Wolfram uh, of Eschenbach, or, but also given that we were talking about Otto, the, the fort of Brunswick before, well, all he is, um, you know, th there were some, uh, you know, th this thugs fundamentally under which Frederick II had been left in southern Italy, such as um, Dippold, uh, Count of Acerra. Well, these guys were ministerialists, they, they went eventually, you know, they redeemed themselves after that. Uh, the, the defeat and went to to fight in in and die in the in the in the Baltic under the Teutonic for the Teutonic Order. 
um, there was a lot a great connection uh, not just of, of Germany but also with, with Poland with Bohemia we find important kings such as Ottokar II later on who would participate properly through these crusades it was a, a way to properly gain that hour of uh, legit of sacral legitimization for having participated to the holy war you know uh, and it was a way also to make Bonnie not not dramatically remunerative because still we we live in, in an age like this where you know the crop rates were ridiculous uh, in fact but you know some loot you know it was just a way to survive sometimes um, and um, there was also uh, uh, an important rise in, uh, in properly in the importance of knighthood as much as uh, war in Germany increased right the same uh, interregnum that would follow the extinction of the Hohenstaufen would see in fact it is, you know at this point all these German powers breaking free from authority or almost because also in here I must say that the the idea of a total anarchy after the the, the disappearance of the Hohenstaufen is a bit you know too dramatic actually it's remarkable to see how in the absence of important assets certain families managed to, to maintain power at a certain point but definitely wars increased right and therefore the market of war was you know more demanding and uh, there were lots of people who took arms to to go fight um, for the the ambitions of this local uh, lords, right? This is manifest also in certain cultural forms. Uh, chivalric epos has in Germany at this point a, a huge uh, spread, uh, as we were saying before, also the French model, so alongside with it, with feudalism, with, with this literature, think about the Minnesänger, think about... Um, th there, there is a, a very power, properly in German literature, and European literature that's coming from the era at this point, a, a, an enormous production, enormous uh, vitality, creativity, that is associated with violence. Some of the most violent individuals you could find at this point as knights in their deeds uh, 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 across Europe at this point were actually poets as well. And it's fascinating because we often recall it turns out biologically that the peak of male creativity is also the peak of male violence. So civilization actually does pass also um, uh, through, through these things which you know, makes you reflect, indeed. Um, and um, there, there, there is here the aforementioned Eichstätt region that produced interesting, uh, an interesting milieu in this regard. But uh, the area is mostly famous for for the the, 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 the most fam one of the greatest epic poets of the time, Wolfram von um, Eschenbach who was thought to, to have been romantically this figure of ministerialis coming from, you know, having at least some vassalitic connection with the Eichstätt region. But later we have essentially debunked both uh, Wolfram's uh, ministeriality and uh, uh, Eichstätt uh, background fundamentally, right? These things have been invented, but still it was plenty of, of, of people like that, right? And as you know, as we were saying before, he would go for the crusade as well, and uh, all this, this, this vision imbued with, uh, with, with a broader, this, you know, in the work of Eschenbach also, you know, imbued with civil pagan ideas that Germany was, at this point, waking up, right? There are, even, even German art, there was this new, renewed, um, uh, humanistic uh, ideal the, on on the on the wake of the, the broader 12th, 13th century European. You know, expansion. Here, think about the con the construction of the Gothic cathedrals, etc. Germany is starting build to build that right, and very speedily, from a background where th there hadn't been nothing like that compared to, to to other countries. And still, it's fascinating because it's mixed between you know the humanistic ideal, but still this vision sometimes of a of a dramatic, beautiful, romantic. Um, nature that still pervades the, this medieval mentality, the, even the darkness, the tragic uh, destiny of the heroes, like in the in the in the pagan epics, right? You know, they live in, within these nights. That they the there is a specific, you know, uh, I would say melancholic, but also you know you know passionate, sentimental bias of German knighthood that is to be shown, you wouldn't expect, even from a tactical point of view, right? I came to, to study these things a little bit, and there is a, you know, a different German behavior on the field from French women, not because they 
they were different, uh, you know, uh, you know, they had, they read or thought different things. Properly, also because of the different development of chivalry in the two areas, right? But let's say the Germans were paradoxically much more individualistic minded, but still more effective in certain realities. That is to say, they obviously had a dramatic collective training as old knights at this time, but they had a more aggressivistic capacity, and sometimes even managing in other battlefields, like in Italy, even to to defeat, compete and defeat with French cavalry, with local cavalry. There are lots of these things, and we'll talk about them at some point. Um, so, it, it's fair to say that without their retinues of ministerialis, bishops and counts at this point in Germany could have not uh, worked politically as effective rulers, right? And this naturally entailed all the properly the maintenance, the recruitment, the maintenance, uh, properly also the integration uh, of this, um, you know, important amount of, of armed men that now were spent uh, at their most in these extremely ferocious and extremely violent, extremely merciless, um, uh, you know, enterprises that were taking part in this very troubled moment um, in German history. Uh, but for now, we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.